You've been going through distortion pedal after overdrive pedal, looking for that great grind and attack that you really want. But should you really be looking at compressors? Probably. Metal Bass Monday. So welcome back and welcome to everybody checking it out for the first time. If you are new and you like gear demo, review, interviews with some of the giants in metal and talk about technique, gear, tips, lessons, this is the place for you. Please subscribe, hit that bell down there, and that's what you can expect coming up. Videos on the regular. And we've got another interview coming up for next week. Patrons, you already know about this one. And uh, your patron segment that's just for you guys, I've put up the post so that you can put what questions you'd like to hear. If you'd like to get in on that, there's also the subscribe star and patron sections where you can get access to other materials, additional interview pieces, and some lessons and live streams for patrons only. Again, links down below, and thank you so much to all the patrons that have signed up and done this. You guys have been awesome. I'm going to ask one question and announce a new thing that's going to move forward, and I'd love to get everybody's input right here before we get into the compression session. That is, uh, I announced a while back I was looking at doing a podcast, and that is a go. That's going to be coming up, and I'm real excited because there's some other stuff coming on that I think is going to make it interesting. I'm going to have a co-host. So, uh, it's going to be a situation where I want to make it a bit larger than just talking about bass gear or technique. I want to do things that come across in a just pure vocal format. So, I wanted to get into some things about the philosophy behind metal, uh, attitudes about things, a bit more of the conceptual things dive deep into post-interview things, talk about what the player we had on said and what we think of it and draw conclusions from that, and other subjects that I think could be interesting that go into a better audio long format type of setup. So I'd love to hear from you and hit me in the comments below. What kind of things would you like to hear in a metal-based broadcast shaped around what we do on this channel? What do you think would be good and would be a good idea for a long form thing? And again, I'm going to branch out a bit, talk about some other things like how metal culture has changed, intellectual property and streaming and the effects on the industry, all kinds of stuff like that. But I'd love to hear what you guys would like to hear more about. And because I want this to be a community, make sure that I give to you exactly what you're looking for, because that's the whole purpose. So... Again, hit me up in the comments. Let's talk about it and launch this podcast right. It's going to be exciting. There's some cool stuff already planned. And so with that, let's talk compressors. Okay, so when we talk about drive and gain and things like that, what I hear from a lot of guys is they'll go through tons of pedals and they actually just want more kind of distortion, but they want more clarity at the same time. They want grit and grind and not necessarily this big smear of sound. And that's been the problem with distortion on bass for a long time. It just turns into this indescribable wall of noise, basically, that just destroys your note definition, things like that. I see guys that just keep going after different distortion pedals, different types of distortion, things that allow the lows to come through, things that only distort on the high, certain types of distortion, things like that. And really, you're only going to get so far with it, no matter how much you go through those things, because you're still dealing with the basic principle of distortion. And a lot of times, the real grit and the hyper-articulation and, dare I say, clank that you want is probably going to come from a different unit and one that's going to make your distortion work better, improve your sound, and give you that real snarl that you're probably wishing a lot of these units would give to you, but they aren't getting. And there's a simple reason why. So we're going to get into that, but first I'm going to give you a real basic primer, if you're not familiar, on compressors and the basic pieces that go into them. So the first thing is just understanding what does a compressor do? Well, if you've got a frequency range of expression of soft notes being down here and hard hit notes and details up here, it squashes them down the more you do it so that soft notes are brought up to a more audible volume and hard notes are brought down so it evens it out. This is going to cost you some dynamic range, so you have to be very careful with how you use this. 
but I'm going to get into how to use it more for distortion than for kind of controlling your signal. So this is what's going to be called your ratio. The higher you crank your ratio, the more that squeeze happens. So think of that as your dynamic range. So if you're doing like four to one, it's probably not going to do a ridiculous amount and help tighten up and give you some more articulation. If you do six, eight to one, or some people even use what's called the limiting function, which is like just a massive amount of crush, then you're really slamming it down to a really small frequency to where you could probably hit really light and hit really hard and you're going to see no perceivable difference in volume. Now this works in conjunction with a couple other functions. One is going to be the threshold. And what the threshold is, is basically exactly what it sounds like. At what level of sound and pressure is it going to kick in? Like, if you have a low threshold, it's going to be, okay, uh, everything, you know, pretty much most of your playing is going to leak through as is. But once it hits a certain ratio, that's going to start knocking it down. You tell it how loud it gets or how soft it gets before it starts pulling things in. The more you set the threshold at a dB level that is going to make it activate sooner and sooner, the more you're going to have a consistent function of the compressor. So the threshold is kind of how often do you want it to jump in and help start pulling those spikes down or those drops up. Now then this works with two more functions, the attack and the release. Pretty simple and kind of self-explanatory. The attack is how fast does it react to it? Uh, so if you have a spike hit, do you want it to instantly jump on it and slam it down? Or do you want it to slowly react to a playing that's getting louder and louder? So if you want a really consistent sound and something that really grabs peaks and pulls it down, you want a fast attack because as soon as it hears something, it's going to react to it. Release is the opposite. How long does it hold on to it before it lets everything open back up to its normal position? Uh, this, If you set these too badly, it can lead to something called pumping, where you hear like a really clamp down sound and then it opens up and then a really clamp down sound and then it opens up. So you get this almost breathing, pulsing type of thing. It can be interesting under some circumstances, but you really kind of want to get this if you're trying to get a consistent sound in a threshold that's going to be pretty active a lot of the time, quick attack, and for me, quick release as well. I just want it to go in and snap and let it go. So just controlling where things are really out of the, the range of acceptability. And, you know, it, all this, again, is going to be dependent because I know you're going to ask what setting should I put on the compressor. It's utterly reliant on exactly what compressor you're using, what pickups you're using, what, but, you know, your signal going into it. How hot is it? This is stuff you have to experiment with. No presets, guys. Sorry. You actually got to work on it for yourself. But it's better in the end, and you're going to learn a lot, and you're really going to be able to dial in your sound exactly the way you want it. So, all that having been said, this is how a compressor functions. But not just evening out your playing, the way you can use it as a sound manipulation tool is because it brings up all the subtle detail in your playing, you get a way more gain-oriented, hyper-detailed, aggressive sound by using it correctly. The last thing to note is that a lot of compressors are known for certain styles of compression. Like you can get very sterile, clean, doesn't touch your sound, doesn't do anything, just strictly, you know, crushes your sound down and helps you control it. Then you have other compressors that are known that as the harder you clamp down, they start adding distortion into things. They start giving you a bit of grit, some other overtones. They have kind of a function that's meant to not sound as harsh on the top, so they dial it off using some natural kind of distortion to smooth that over, and that can be really useful in dialing something in. So here's how we want to look at compression 
now that we understand it, as part of our sound to detail and make it much more aggressive. We want to look at it in three factors. One, getting the detail out of it. That's what you know most guitar heads and distortions are doing, is they're adding detail because distortion naturally compresses. So if you compress beforehand, you're, you're giving more compression overall to the distortion signal. The next one being, can you make it much more aggressive but have it be clear so you don't need quite as much distortion, actual distortion, because the compressor is giving you this, you know, more of the clang when you hit the frets, more of the sound of your pick or your fingers grinding across the strings. All those little details that give you that hyper snarl that comes from having a really compressed sound or a correctly compressed one if you're using it to bring up these details. And then the final one is, because you can usually control the output of a compressor, you can use it as a clean boost going into your distortion unit. So that's going to drive the input circuit harder, giving you a higher signal going in that's going to hit the distortion. And rather, using the, rather than using the distortion as a boost, you have a boost hitting the distortion. So it's not on the output of the distortion that you're gaining your overall output, it's on the input, and that's going to make the distortion react in a different way. Plus, if you bring out brightness and clarity and all this detail, you're going to be hitting with all these really present harmonics going into the compressor, and that makes for a much more aggressive sound. So you may be using right now the drive that you actually would be totally happy with if you just put a compressor in front of it and dialed it incorrectly. So to demonstrate this, I've got a industry standard, one we all probably have or have used at one point or another. I'm going to be using the Sans Amp bass driver, and I've got it at a fairly neutral setting, part blend, and let's listen to what it sounds like without compression. So, sounds decent enough, you get a little bit of grit, you get a little bit of grind, all that's going on. Now, let's hear the dramatic difference when I activate a compressor. Uh, no, I'm not pushing it hard enough to add grit, but I am giving it a ton of clarity and an output boost. big difference, yeah? Much more clarity, much more aggression, and it sounds basically like it's been taken from mono to 3D. That's the additional clarity. The things to listen for are you're hearing much more detail in it. You're hearing much more of that clang and grind and punch. So let's hear it back to back again. I'm going to switch it on and off while I just ride a string here. So, what are the odds? If you put a compressor in front of the drive pedal you already think you're not quite that happy with, that would probably get you to where you want to go. Again, punch, grind, aggression, grit, all that stuff, plus your playing's going to level out a lot more. Uh, all those softer pieces or places where you want to have a more consistent level to make sure that you're absolutely cutting through the guitars as hard as the, that you want to and that the pulse that you're laying down with the drums feels as good and the notes are consistent. Compression. So it's really kind of the magic sauce to a lot of things. Drive, grind, and grunt. All in one thing, plus you sound better in the end. Now here's a last thing that I'll give you that's part of my sound and something that's important as far as what I do that a lot of people don't seem to get a hold of and they kind of shoot themselves in the foot. So this may seem a little extreme, but I use two compressors. I actually use 
um, uh, the unit I use, the AMT Pangea, I go in because it has two different sides and I use one compressor on the way in. And that's to level out my basic dynamics and hit my distortion harder and do all this grit and grind type of thing to get my initial sound. What most people miss is it's really important to have a compressor at the end because if you EQ at any part in this process, even though you've compressed your sound, as it goes through, when you EQ, you raise the volume of a certain resonant peak. So you've got your sound all nice and crunchy and compressed here, and then you add EQ and lift, say, 200 and 1K and 4K. Now you have things that are popping up because they're creating spikes after it's been compressed. So the compressor isn't controlling these resonant frequencies. So I do a simple, usually in between four to six on the opposite end after everything else, after my uh, my speaker sim, all my effects, everything, to clamp it down and make sure those resonant frequencies aren't busting through either, so that it's just as consistent as it was before I did my EQ. So you want to tame anything that comes after the initial compression, because anything you do that screws around with that sound before on you know hitting the way out, it's now going to change and not be as efficiently a compressed signal. So that's how you use the second compressor. Again, part of what I do, if you're not using a boost, stick it on the other end. But for me, two compressors, that's the way it goes. One to control the bass, and then one to control the finished sound. So that's a piece I use, and it has become really invaluable. Uh, it's a big part of the way I control my sound, and because a lot of times I'm jumping through different EQs or adding effects or things like that that change w the amount of frequencies that are actually getting punched up and down, having that second press compressor is invaluable. And the other thing is a lot of players use a compressor on the way out and they don't think about it, or I'm sorry, on the way in. And the other thing is a lot of players as basis because they're used to doing studio work, and that's where I think this kind of comes from, is that they use it after their bass on the way in, but they don't think about it on the way out. And to me, it's kind of useless at that point to a certain degree. If you do use a lot of EQ or you're going into something that really manipulates your sound, it's no longer tamed. So having it at the end can be invaluable. So I hope that fills you in. I hope you understand compression now. Uh, how it can be used, and how it can really turn kind of your lame, boring, and not really cut through distortion sound into the massive snarling beast of destruction that you've been looking for. Uh, it's a really hidden secret that's right out in the open. So many players do it, but they don't credit that much of their sound to it. So now you know. So what do you think of this, and do you use compression differently than I do? Do you use it in your signal? And do you think that this is going to help you push your pedals or find a new way to use them and your distortions into a new range? Or did you watch this and go try it? Report back with how it goes. Any of those, hit me up in the comments. Let's have a conversation as always. I'd really be interested to see how you guys are already using it and if this changed how you're using compression in your signal. I think it'll be a big bonus to you. So that's going to be a wrap for this Metal Bass Monday. Always awesome to hang with you guys. Again, let's jump down in the comments. Let me know what you think of on the podcast. Let me know what you think on the compression. Let's talk about it. And as always, I appreciate you being here. I will see you next time.